please welcome our next panel, our moderator, Andrew Edgecliffe Johnson, Lior Meyer, Kara Bachman, and Mayor Kasim Reed. Please welcome all panelists. All right, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, and do, uh, do take a seat when you're, if you're at the back. Um, so I thought I, I couldn't start this off without a little FT content. So uh, uh, that's what you're relying on us for. So I was struck by um, a quote that I read in the FT from, I think, uh, last year from a former Olympic rower turned economist, um, as you do, um, who said, from a theoretical economic point of view, the modern day Olympic Games creates hardly any net benefit for the host city. Uh, and this debate comes around every four years or so with the Olympics. Um, his theory was that, the, that applicants have, it's got to a stage now where applicants raise their bids to such an extent now in the auction process for any major sporting event that the, the net advantage, as he put it, the difference between the gross benefits and the, the price paid are negligible. So I am guessing that our panel uh, will disagree with that, but um, let me first uh, introduce them. Uh, starting on my right, we have uh, Mayor Reed, Mayor Kazim Reed from, uh, from Atlanta, a um, city that brought us the Olympics 20 years ago. Um, and is about to host its third Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Cara Backman has a home team advantage. Uh, mm -hmm. She is the executive director of the Chicago Sports Commission um, and in charge of the city's destination marketing efforts, which have included bringing the NFL draft, the World Triathlon uh, competition, and the um, Big Ten basketball uh, to the city, and indeed the America's Cup. Uh, and to my right, uh, we have Leo Mayer, not a mayor, uh, those, he tells me his grandfather was, um, who is the director of brand marketing uh, for Tel Aviv Global, um, uh, which in how many hours time is about to host the? 12 hours and counting. Okay, in 12 hours and counting, we'll host one of the world's largest gay pride parades in Tel Aviv. Um, so a great diversity of different events you're, you're in charge of. But let, let me start um, with you, if I may, uh, Mary. You live in a city which has had that experience of hosting one of the biggest of all global sporting events, cultural events, uh, the Olympic Games 20 years ago. You've got the benefit of hindsight now. What would you say the legacy is? Uh, I think le the legacy is, um, first and foremost, I'm here. Uh, I mean, I really think that uh, the Centennial Olympic Games changed the city of Atlanta forever uh, and really positioned it to be the most dominant economy in the Southeast. And if you look at the investment post-Centennial Olympic Games, and we competed against Athens, Greece, so we had a really competitive process. Uh, we spent about 3.5 to 3.9 billion on the Olympics and we made a profit. And uh, our universities, benefited in a way that uh, we never would have contemplated. Uh, Georgia State got dormitories. The Georgia Institute, Institute of Technology got dormitories. The Atlanta University Center got dormitories. But really, Atlanta, uh, when we travel around the world, um, people remember the Olympics right next to remembering that Atlanta is the home of Coca-Cola and CNN and Delta Airlines and UPS. So if you look at where we were 20 years ago, uh, as I sit here uh, today, Atlanta is the center of a six million person metro region. We have the third largest concentration of Fortune 500 businesses and an airport that handled 100 million passengers last year. And I think that it really did start, that positioning started with prevailing in the Centennial Olympic Games. The final comment I would make is this. Now, I'm organizing to secure a major event like the Olympic Games um, really does create relationships between the civic, political, and business community that last a lifetime and that are really uh, unrivaled. And so what I think my colleagues will point out is competing and going through that process allows you to get to know people in a way that you would otherwise not get to know them. 
So 20 years later, I sit here right now. Uh, and last week, we won the 50, Super Bowl 53, which will be played in Atlanta in 2019. Uh, and I'm pretty happy about that. But I mean, we built a $1.4 billion stadium, so hopefully we will get a Super Bowl. But beyond that, um, in 2018, we'll host the college football championship. In 2019, we host the Super Bowl. And in 2020, we host the NCAA Final Four. And we're one of the most five most visited cities in, in America now. That wasn't the case just 20 years ago. So, you know, I would love to debate anyone that would argue that uh, that moment in uh, 20 years ago when we won the Olympics was not time, energy, and passion uh, that was very well spent. So I want to come back and drill down into uh, to a bunch of those uh, things. But Cara, Chicago has um, bet on a whole series of, of different sporting events. This is, a, this is a, a strategy that doesn't just rest on the NFL or in the Olympics or on FIFA or anything. What, talk us through what the rationale is for Chicago. Well, to carry on from the Olympic theme, which, you know, ironically, here we are, 2016, people are talking about Rio, of course, um, a city we were um, competing against to host the games uh, this summer, and um, slightly envious of, you know, everything that Atlanta has realized 20 years later, because I just think about if we were sitting here in 2036, you know, all the stories that we'd be able to tell that I know would have brought such great benefit to our city. Um, I think from the onset when Chicago came together to pursue an Olympic bid and be the candidate city for the US, it was about being on the global stage. It was, we think we're a world-class city. You know, you can talk about it all you want, but then walk out there on the world stage mm -hmm. and show the rest of the world that you are that global city. Um, that invites, we have two international airports, but hey, if we're not bringing in enormous amounts of international travelers, then we're not a global city. So I think we are a global city, we are an Olympic city, we have great um, Olympic spirit still in the city, and the strategy that we're looking at now following our uh, Olympic bid is the global stage. So when we look at international championships and working with international federations with whom many of which we initiated the relationship during the Olympic bid process. And so even though we're not hosting the games, we have realized benefits to our city um, for having gone through the process. So I do share you know, the same thoughts that you get to know people you know, in your city and then also out, outside of your city, of course, and create those relationships that then lead to other opportunities. So um, Gay Pride, Parade is not on the same global media you know, stage as uh, something like the, the Olympics or the, the World Cup. But why, why has it been so important to your positioning of Tel Aviv as a global city? Look, I think my job or my, what I'm supposed to do, and I mm -hmm. hope I do it well, is to tell Tel Aviv's story. And when you tell a story of a city, you need to be very true to who you are. And I think that what Gay Pride gives us in Tel Aviv and just sort of this, Tel Aviv is a city of 450,000 residents. The fact that a representative from Tel Aviv is sitting on the stage together with Atlanta and Chicago is for us an achievement. And it's for us a result of a few years that we've been putting into promoting Tel Aviv globally and creating name recognition of the city as a global city. And we believe that in order to be a global player, you need to be unique and you need to be relevant. And the one way to be both those things is to be true to who you are. So what Gay Pride gives us is a medium to tell our story, to explain to the world or to present to the world who we are, and hopefully the best version of who we are. So just, just briefly, how would you describe that story? What is? I think Tel Aviv is what you wouldn't expect. And that's our biggest strength, I think, and the, the, I think to an extent the reason I'm sitting here on the stage again, because it's something that you wouldn't expect, and the reason and the, oh, sorry, the fact that Tel Aviv is the largest gay pride parade, one of the largest in the world and the largest in the Middle East, is because it doesn't have many contenders in the Middle East. We're in a region where this isn't part of sort of the, the culture. 
and being unique and being liberal and going against the stream and being innovative and creative thinking is the story that we're trying to show the world. And gay pride is one of the mediums through which to tell that story. Right. So this is a, this is a branding, uh, branding initiative. The, I want to come, I want to go into, get a little sort of crunchy uh, here on the sort of return on investment because, you know, this is, this is the Financial Times. Uh, yes. you know, uh, when you look at the, you, you know, you, you say you've seen enormous returns from that, that Olympic, um, hosting the Olympics 20 years ago. Can you break that down into what were the most tangible benefits? Happily. Was that infrastructure? Happily. So if you look at the document that was included uh, that laid out a series of studies, including FT, AT Kearney, other important respectable, respectable global indicators of who are the leading cities, if you pull out your document right now and go to the last page in it, the last two or three pages, Atlanta is the only southern city that is consistently referenced across five categories. Right. And so I would argue that there has to be a moment where the world determines whether it's interested or not. The city of Atlanta, as I sit here right now, uh, is in the top 35 most globally important cities in the world by three important indicators. Uh, certainly, A.T. Kearney is in the top 10 in the United States of America. What I would point out is, look at when that growth and when that occurred. Uh, all of our indicators today show that we are a stronger city than we were 20 years ago. So Standard & Poor's um, recently gave us a AA plus credit, credit rating. Moody's, Fitch did the same thing. So there are only five, six, or seven cities that have better credit than we do. That's an important indicator. Our population has grown by 36,000 people between 2010 and 2014. Within the last 24 months, we've had 13 regional or national businesses move their headquarters into the city of Atlanta. Uh, in terms of construction, we have the, the highest level of construction in the history of the city of Atlanta, and we've passed the Centennial Olympic Games. So those are concrete examples that FT readers can follow and that are easily verifiable. Yeah. I mean, how much of that sort of business is relocating, you know, sort of job creation, et cetera, can you attribute to Atlanta's identity as a sort of cultural and, and events hub? Has that been? Here's what I think the Olympics did. The Olympics said that there is a place in the southeast which is where the U.S.'s growth is moving. The, the U.S.'s population is moving south and west. So if you're a global investor, and you want to move around the world because we have the second most connected airport in America, you can fly to Atlanta and get to 80% of US GDP in two hours or less. I think when people see that major events continue to choose the city, it causes for them to pull away the layers of the onion. And then when they hear stories like Coca-Cola is there and UPS is there, and when you watch CNN, it was founded by an Atlanta named Ted Turner. And when you look at a Delta plane, 80,000 employees, it's in Atlanta, a deal negotiated between the mayor of Atlanta and C. Woman. All of those things give business and capital the confidence to flow in. You know, business understands yes and no, it doesn't understand maybe. So when you win something, I think that it causes the world to pay attention. And if you look at how rapidly we're moving in terms of where foreign direct investment is going, I think it bears that out. I think that folks have bought all the condos that they can buy in London, New York, San Francisco, LA, and Chicago, and there's getting ready to be a second trunk, trunk of capital. And right. I think that Atlanta is going to be uh, among those cities. So for us, uh, the Olympics was a moment. And if you look at our win around the Super Bowl, it was just like it. We didn't win the, Super, the Olympics on the first ballot. We won it on the fourth because we had a mayor named Ambassador Andrew Young who had been a UN ambassador. And so he had relationships that when the votes got thick, he knew people in different parts of the world. He helped us win. Similarly, if you look at our Super Bowl win, we didn't win it on the first ballot. We won it on the fourth um, because you know, we've got the bones for it and we've shown uh, that we can do it. The Final Four that we hosted just two years ago was the most successful Final Four in history. So we had D1, Division Two, and D3 
all in the same city, all at the same time, got everybody in and got everybody out. Well, what happened? In addition to what happened two years ago, the success we had there, the president of the NCAA Final Four brought it back in 2020. And I think that business looks at that and says, hey, you know, Standard & Poor's said they got AA plus, record amounts of cash in the bank, no tax increases, crime down 28% over a six year period of time. I think business looks at those kinds of metrics and capital follows. So, so Curry, you didn't win the big prize on the first or the fourth ballot, um, mm -hmm. but what returns do you think Chicago has seen on its investment in, uh, in other sporting events, in uh, the Big Ten, the, the, the draft, the NFL draft, et cetera? Um, those, to, to kind of touch back on the investment really that we made for the Olympics that then is why we can even talk about the return on our investment for these other events. So we um, lost the opportunity to host the games in October of 2009 and um, November 2011 was when the sports commission was created. So there was never a sports commission in Chicago prior to, and it hasn't even been five years, um, which a lot of people are a little you know, confused about because they thought, how, how would you assemble an organization and bid for the largest sporting event in the world? Um, that was your kind of first go. Um, so because we lost that, there also became, became very obvious that there's a need in Chicago to have that the group, the organization that's, in, that's working with the city, that's working in tourism. It's a very integrated, just melding of the public-private partnership. Um, and that enabled us to go after Big Ten, and Big Ten had, had left Chicago and gone to other cities. So we assembled, we went after Big Ten, and we've hosted two very successful years. In 2013, the first return of the Big Ten to the United Center, we sold out um, the tournament faster than they've ever sold and did it in all sessions, didn't have to even go to single session sales, returned in 2015, and they're already planning on coming back in 2019 and 2021. So now we're seeing not only getting business back, but the business that we've fought to return, they're becoming repeat clients and giving us the ability to project um, what type of returns we can see as we continue to those relationships and that investment. Big 10, I would say on average is about um, between 15 and 18,000 room nights that would, can be tied to that event, which is important as well because it takes place in March and I will not be talking about the weather, but um, in March we usually have to uh, work a little harder to get some business to Chicago. So th On the flip th side, less Zika risk. Not great for mosquitoes. That's right, yeah, no, they Chicago. can't live in that environment at all. Um, but the return on investment that we saw um, with the NFL draft, which you know, I, I mentioned to you when we, we spoke earlier, that we can't host a Super Bowl at this point in time. And uh, you know, we don't have a stadium that's large enough, and uh, that wouldn't work. But the NFL, as Mayor Reed knows very well, that's a massive amount of business that you can't be a major city in the U.S., and not have a piece of. And now we see what the NFL is going to London, hosting games in Mexico City. So it's, it, is, it has been global. NFL will remain global. And that continues our pathway towards being a global city that we think we are and that we want to be. Um, in 2015, we hosted the first NFL draft that was held outside of New York, New York City in 51 years. Uh, so I'd been there 51 years, and the last 11 of that had been at Radio City Music Hall. Uh, we worked with the NFL in, in a really tremendous partnership and uh, built something totally new and different and used it to drive demand to our city. And the power of the NFL, um, the, the marketing power, the reach, the interest, the intrigue. Oh, and now they're also doing something new. Everybody can go and it's free and it's hosted in Chicago, which is accessible from every NFL market. Um, and we saw 
almost 40,000 room nights, which I still think is a very conservative estimate, which we uh, conducted a study with Temple University on uh, the economic and social impact of hosting the event. Um, almost 82 million in economic impact can be attributed to um, the three-day event in 2015. 115 million uh, dollars in media value. And I, I don't know what your marketing and media budget is, but I, Ours is nowhere near that. We would, <laughs> there's no way we could have ever paid that kind of money to get that level of um, media attention back to the city. Uh, we just, uh, just slightly over a month ago, concluded uh, hosting the 2016 draft. And uh, we, again, are working with Temple, and they are going to be giving us um, the results of the study. But we already know that we had more people in attendance um, it was over 225,000 people came through Draft Town, which is right across the street in Grant Park over those three days. So something that we consider very much worth it and um, has a lot, hits on a lot of variables. Leo, have you conducted similar economic impact studies on the Gay Pride Parade? Um, it's a question we've dealt with a lot because the ability to um, examine or to measure the success of an event like this isn't just, first of all, it isn't just the amount of money that it brings in, because first and foremost, it serves the residents of the city. And sometimes as global cities, we have a notion or we make the mistake of thinking of how we serve the world. At the end of the day, cities are paid for and should serve the people who live in them. And that's the, the first, um, first point on our agenda. The second is, and this is the answer we usually give, we can't stop people at the airport and say, excuse me, are you gay? It doesn't work. And our ability to measure the success is limited. This year we're doing for the first time a research into how many people actually came for the event. Our estimation is that about 35,000 people will come for gay-related events during 2016 to Tel Aviv. And that's in a city with about a million incoming tourists a year. So it's pretty large for yep. a specific event. And the, the, so the total, total participation in, in the parade itself, how, how large is that? About, this year we're estimating 200,000. Right, okay, so the vast majority is a domestic Huge, uh, yeah. audience, but it's, but that 35, 40,000 on top is, uh, yeah. in, is good. I think in general, and this is something that we've learned through this event, is that you can bid for events, international events, and then you put in your bid and you can win them, or you can work from the bottom up, and that's what we've tried to do over the last few years with this event. It's something that is very much part, like I said, part of the story, but also, the local pride of the residents and the people who live within the city, it's something they relate to, it's something they celebrate. And then building on that and creating a global event and working year after year, and it's a bit specific because you need to do it every time, another half a step forward. And bit by bit, you manage to, at the end of the day, position it as a global event. And then people start returning and they tell their friends and they become by themselves ambassadors, etc. So that's so we, that's the sort of money coming in. We can measure the, the re returns. You know, to greater or, or lesser accuracy in room nights or, uh, or visits. Um, the upfront money out is always a hurdle, a massive hurdle. We always see this question of why should I be spending money on a stadium when I should, could be spending it on a school. Um, you know, as a mayor, um, how do you strike that balance? You've, you've overseen a turnaround in yes, Atlanta's um, budget, but how have you found, you know, uh, that made the case for investment in facilities for these events? I think, first of all, you have to be uh, sensitive to the moment that we're in. The fact of the matter is, when people say that money that we would have invested in the stadium could have been spent in schools, um, respectfully, they frequently don't know what they're talking about. The money that we invested in stadiums wouldn't have been spent in schools because our legislature wouldn't have put it in the schools. If they wanted to, they could have done that. Uh, the other point that I would make is that for us, just imagine, uh, we have about 220,000 people in the metro region um, who derive their livelihoods from 49.5 million people who visited Atlanta last year. And so I feel comfortable going into any community anywhere and having a conversation about what it means for the city of Atlanta to be among the five most visited cities in the United States. So New York is number one. Um, Orlando is number two. You can't replicate Disney World. Uh, I believe that Chicago is either three or four. You have Las Vegas, Nevada. I think Los Angeles is in that mix somewhere. And then you have the city of Atlanta. So my argument is 
You can't think just about the folks who come in town for the college football playoffs. You got to think about that dad that works in a restaurant who supports his family as a chef. And when those restaurants are packed, those are the folks that I'm focused on. You can say whatever you want, but there are 10,000 hotel rooms within a 10-minute walk of our football arena. When those hotel rooms are filled, in the hotel business, you can literally start from the very bottom and work to the top of the hotel and have a career and a life. So one, um, I try to be very direct and clear about my decisions and call them with a long runway because you need to have it out. Um, I made the decision to build a $1.4 billion football stadium and invest $200 million in public money before I had a re-election. You did that I did in, it the, before in I the got, face of a re-election I did it campaign. before I had an election in November. Okay. I, I laid out why I felt it was the right thing to do because if we hadn't built a new stadium, our hotel motel tax would have been, would gone away. That hotel motel tax throws off eight to 10 million in cash to my general fund that supports police, fire, and public safety personnel. So you pay well, that back in- We have a bad years. habit, Andrew, of getting tired and believing that people should know that, as opposed to going to 30 town halls and saying, it's not the same, right? It makes a massive difference. What would happen to the city of Atlanta if we had had an empty stadium? One of the things that we did that I think changed the conversation, Andrew, um, initially our stadium was going to be in Midtown near Georgia Tech, which is already successful and thriving. We put our stadium um, near one of the poorest communities in Atlanta, Vine City and English Avenue. And then last year, uh, we won a $30 million Choice Neighborhoods grant that's going to leverage $400 million in investment in that community. And so the bottom line is I got reelected with 84% of the vote. I was transparent about where I wanted to go. I never hedged and I never mixed words. I said I was going to keep the football team in downtown Atlanta. This is what it costs to achieve my objective. It's $200 million in public money. Taxpayers aren't on the hook for it. It's paid by hotel motel guests. Right? So, Nobody's paying for that. The Atlanta Braves came to me and asked me for 150, 200, 250 million with no revenue stream. And my decision was different. And they moved 12 miles down the road and somebody's paying 400 million to subsidize their stadium. So the facts are very different. And I think in my business, Andrew, and in our business, you can't get tired of explaining to people wherever they are. I think the mistake that elected officials and, and business leaders in this space make is to assume that everybody understands the argument that we have in our social circles. So, Cara, listening to that and going back to what you were saying about you know, Chicago does not have a, a sort of NFL-ready stadium right mm -hmm. now. Um, it's got a few pension bills to pay. It's got a few other uh, things on the mayor's plate. Um, is there the political will to repeat uh, you know, what the mayor pulled off in Atlanta? Can we, you know, will we see uh, an NFL stadium in Chicago anytime soon? You know, Soldier Field, I don't know how many people here have had the opportunity to go, but it's incredible. It's, we had a renovation uh, fairly recently about, oh, I guess, 10, 11 years ago now, and um, few comments about that. Some people thought it looked like a spaceship landed in it, but I will tell you, out of the 62,500 seats in that stadium, there is not a bad seat. And you go back to what we've been talking about, the residents, and starts with them, and this is a massive sports town. We love our Bears. They haven't won a Super Bowl for 30 years, um, but we love our Bears. And everyone who's going, goes to that stadium is going to be able to watch them be in that environment and remain true to how Chicago celebrates sports and supports their teams and, and loves the Bears, win or lose. Um, there really hasn't been too much discussion about do we want to build an NFL stadium and quite frankly, um, and I have zero ownership in the Bears and um, not responsible for 
making decisions about uh, the investment in new infrastructure from a sporting standpoint or otherwise, but with getting the draft, I mean, we constantly said to the NFL, um, this is our Super Bowl, so much to the point where they are, they're talking about saying, oh, now it, we kind of have two Super Bowls a year, um, that the draft can be that big, that large, that powerful, um, and for cities, there's cities, many cities, um, like Chicago and not like Chicago, that don't have the right infrastructure, they're not able to make the investment, don't want to, whatever the case may be, but they can still have a piece of that, of that pie. Right. Um, we have a lot of investment going on in the city, in infrastructure. At McCormick Place, we, um, by, in about a year, the new event center will be open, which is a 10,000 person stadium, something that we actually have a need for. Um, What's going to be? What's it going to host? So it it will host uh, many events, but the intent was to bring DePaul, uh, one of our major universities here, to bring their basketball, men's basketball, women's basketball downtown to the city. Uh, they've been playing their games in Rosemont at Allstate Arena, and you know they've seen fall off, and so it's back to the community. And when we talk about tourism, there's the educational tourism piece. We're attracting students to come be residents of our city for four years, maybe longer. Maybe they'll stay here once they have those connections and ties um, to your city. And now they'll be able to have an appropriate size venue, which also is going to be leveraged to recruit a number of other events. Um, going back to our Olympic family, we have a lot of the national governing bodies just they can't wait for those doors to open because, again, it it's actually fits a need with that 10,000 person capacity. We don't have a facility like that. And it's an extension of McCormick Place and creates more opportunity for convention attendees and to continue to build that campus and investment around there in a very, I think, smart and strategic way that makes sense, that's not overburdened and can be purposed. Leo, we've been talking a lot about physical infrastructure, about stadiums, about airports and stuff. What, what, is Tel Aviv, what kind of infrastructure has Tel Aviv needed to put in place to make the Gay Pride Parade a success? Not much, to be honest, because again, it sits and it's an organic event that sort of built itself and it wouldn't have built itself had it not had the right infrastructure. We have one of our biggest strong points internationally is the beach. So we've invested over the last few years and are still investing about $30 million in redoing the beach boardwalk, which is the place where the gay pride parade walks along, but that's a day a year. There's 364 days, four other days when there's no gay pride. And again, this is, to be honest with you, if ever Tel Aviv was, were to bid for the Olympics, I'd pack my bags and run away because I don't think we'd be able to do it. I think it would be what we call in Hebrew a balagan, which is sort of a word for a, a big mess. And I think you could do it. <laughs> Don't say that to anyone. Um, we can do a joint bid for the three. So. Yeah, as long as you guys do everything, we're willing to go on the table. <laughs> um, and I think a uh, city has to have prospects or an agenda or plans for the future that suit the city and that suit the buildup of the city and that unique human interaction that, hap that can take place a long time only in that specific city. And it needs to happen together with the residents. I can give you an example. Um, this year for Gay Pride, the Ministry of Tourism, the National Ministry of Tourism, was supposed to, out, to go out with the largest incoming tourism campaign in Israeli history, which was aimed at Gay Pride. And this was a huge issue because this is the state of Israel deciding that its largest campaign ever will be focused on gay tourism, on attracting non-Jewish gay tourists from around the world, right? Certain parts of Israeli society, this isn't exactly bontan. And they came to the table where they had decided already and they knew what the campaign was going to be and where they were going to focus it. And the local gay community decided they're not going to play along with it. And the campaign at the end of the day was canceled. And one of the arguments that was made by the community, and this was during hours upon hours of meetings where we tried to mediate between them, was you're bringing the world to look at the animals in the zoo, but the animals are hungry and we're not willing to be hungry animals with, with people looking at us. Invest not in bringing tourism, invest in the community, invest in education, right. in safety, etc. Mm. And I think to an extent they're right and to an extent they're wrong because tourism is a driver of economy and whoever doesn't understand that doesn't understand how macroeconomy works. 
but it can't, it can't be exclusive. It needs to be part of an overall agenda and an overall policy. So for the lack of a better word, you can't, when you're promoting a city globally, build on a one night stand. You need to marry an issue. You need to be there with that issue, with the community behind that issue, ongoing in policy. When the world isn't looking and when there are parades in the street, you need to work with people and invest in them. And then the pivot of that process can be an event. And I think it's true also for sports and investing in sports groups and sports infrastructures as well. Do you have a similar discussion in Chicago in the commission about what kind of events suit the city? What, you know, what, what it makes a Chicago event as opposed to an Atlanta event? Yes, and again, no weather discussion, but that is one variable that <laughs> you have to sometimes start with. Um, but what fits the city, I mean, it is a mix of variables that we are always considering and you kind of weight them differently depending on the strength of certain variables at the time. It may uh, make something else a lower priority. Um, and I'm talking about everything from the you know, if there is an upfront investment that is required and non-negotiable, and if, there, if, if the sport or event is popular in key markets that we already have a very strong um, um, tourism um, opportunity with. You know, if, if we can tap into certain markets that we know we're delivering visitors from and, and we have investment in and we continue to build the Chicago brand there and push more visitors, that becomes a factor. How, how many media are going to attend? What's the exposure? Are they doing live broadcast? How many countries do they broadcast to? Um, you know, is it elite athletes? And are those, is that a big prestige that is going to um, bring more people to come? Is there a fan event? It's just, you know, how many streets do you have to close? Um, because again, it goes back to um, what everyone has said is it, it starts with the residents. If you don't have the locals and the residents um, supporting what you're doing, invested in what you're doing, and for the majority of re residents, um, you know, view it as favorable, it's very hard to make it a su successful. It's kind of a 2016 bid. I mean, you have to have your constituents be supportive of that type of event coming to your city or I mean, the event owner won't take you seriously either. We, we've seen quite a, you know, a lot of pushback uh, in certain cities. Boston, I think it's mm -hmm. 2024, they, they abandoned uh, after the mayor got cold feet after the pushback he'd had from, from voters. I think it, Oslo, Munich had referendums on uh, uh, the Winter Olympics that they, they, that they couldn't get through. Um, what, you know, where do you see the bad. Money? Referendum bad. <laughs> I'm just joking. I'm sorry. Hey, I've, <laughs> I uh, didn't do one. I've just registered to vote in my home country on Brexit. But um, um, what, where do you see, wh when you're proposing investment in, in events, where do you see the biggest pushback? What are, what are people's main concerns? Is it about? I think uh, folks' main concern is making sure people who live in the city benefit verifiably and that you have uh, a set of priorities and a set of standards, and that's going to be the future test. The future test is showing deliverables for people that live in the city um, because we can't have a situation where and we have our own residents uh, pushing their noses up against the glass, but they can't uh, access the, prior, the, the prosperity that's being generated. That's why, um, as I sit here right now, um, we have more than 28 percent women and minority participation uh, in the 1.4 billion dollar Mercedes-Benz Stadium because that was a demand from the community. Um, in just a little while I'm getting ready to go to my city council um, with a retrofit for our basketball team. So we'll spend somewhere between 125 million and 150 million um, uh, to retrofit our arena. Uh, so. Um, a part of that will be a community benefits initiative um, that makes it clear uh, that we're trying to make sure um, that people are getting a fair shot and a fair shake and opportunities they typically uh, would not have had. And that we're specifically identifying the number of jobs on a short-term basis and on a long-term basis. And that we're adding levels of training that we had not added before so that when the stadium is built or the arena is retrofitted, folks get to, to move on with their lives in a condition better than they were before we made the investment. So, so we've talked a bit about the one night stand issue and um, how, how do you all see um, 
events place within the broader year-round tourism strategy. I mean, if you take Chicago, a lot of us come here for, for events, but a lot of us come to Gorp at Frank Gehry buildings or to, uh, uh, you know, come to the Institute of Art or uh, to the Art Institute or to, um, you know, visit you know, relatives doing educational tourism in, in one of the universities. Um, you know, how, how much is the city focused on that longer term, uh, sort of three, 365 day a year um, tourism infrastructure and how does that play into your, your discussions about priorities? For us, it's a, for us, it's an essential part because we think that's how we got where we are today. We think that uh, major events uh, bring decision makers into the city who, if we do a good job, take a second look when they're expanding their offices, uh, choosing a regional headquarters, but if they hadn't had a personal experience that was favorable, mm. that's far less likely. Um, you know, during a Super Bowl, there are a billion people watching the Super Bowl around the world. Uh, every single time there's a commercial that's valued in the millions of dollars, there's going to be an image of our city and decision makers who are experiencing our city. And so that's a high risk, high reward proposition. But I like it because of what it does to my team. It forces my team to be at its best because of the extraordinary level of scrutiny, which can be punishing uh, if we don't do it well. That's why the final four and their decision to come back in 2020 was personally satisfying to me. Right. Because we hosted the biggest games up to that time, and we did it in a manner that said, hey, we're going back there in, in 2020. We're hosting the college football playoffs on a repeat basis. And so, um, as I said before, for us, it's about a key sector. Uh, the, the convention and tourism sector for us is a 10 to $13 billion sector that employs 220,000 people. And our argument every time we compete is that we have hosted the largest event in the world and we can host your event. Mm -hmm. And these are the organizations that have, since the Olympics, said that this is the city that, um, that has a heart uh, and the intellectual capability to deliver. Right. The current, you see a similar sort of juggling act there between the sort of the one-off and the long term. Yes, I mean, I think that it's, I mean, that's really where there is the parallel to really any business. You're always deciding where you're making your investment, what's gonna get you the greatest ROI, what's the opportunity cost. If I host the draft, does that mean I'm not able to host another event because financially we, we, we can't do more that year or because there's another opportunity over those, that same date? Um, so you're, you're looking at all of that. So, but I have, I, I agree with, you know, the community that feel just the pride and you're unified and not just hospitality. I mean, they are, they're, they're often the first touch point. And if you have that bad experience getting in your cab at O'Hare, I hope everybody had lovely cab drivers, um, then you, you, you start your, your experience off not the right way. So the, our hospitality community here is amazing in my opinion. And, you know, while Yes, Sheridan wants the business and so does Hyatt and Hilton, but everybody comes together and knows that it's for the betterment of the city, that we work together, we have shared practices, we make people feel welcome and that they return. So whether it's showcasing your city to that target audience that Mayor Reed talked about, those decision makers, and that they're then considering it, or your your average fan or a student athlete, you know, they have a good experience, they become your repeat client. And so from a leisure marketing, leisure tourism perspective, we are advertising um, all, year, all year round throughout the US and internationally with major focus on China, Great Britain, Brazil, Mexico City, and Canada are really the international markets that are really big to us and then of course, there's certain cities in the US that we target, and we are peppering them throughout the year with our brand and showing them what Chicago is, and then with those one-off events, using those as the demand generators to really drive tourism, making sure that we're at the highest occupancy possible, and every, every chef is cooking as many meals as he can, and 
everybody has to be cleaning rooms and every cab driver is driving his cab. So that's the strategy definitely it spans across and kind of ends up being a bit of a calendar puzzle, if you will. <laughs> Leo, what brings people to Tel Aviv outside Gay Pride? I hope a lot of things. Um, I think what Tel Aviv has to offer as a tourism product is a combination between, a combination which is actually pretty rare, surprise, surprisingly, between a beach, but really a beach, I mean not some, what you can find many places around the world, just some short or narrow strip of sand, a real beach culture, and an urban, vibrant, cultural city. And that combination, I think, exists in other places around the world. Miami is a good example. Rio is an excellent example. Sydney. But it's not very common. And that, I think, is the number one driver of tourism for Tel Aviv. Again, we have specific target groups or specific parts of our product which generate target groups like the gay community, like architecture lovers. Tel Aviv is, the, is a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of its architecture, so it generates a bit. But the most, to, the, to a large part, people come either because they're Jewish and that's something we don't, we think, or we consider to be very important as a driver of tourism, or because they're drawn to a dynamic, cool, young city, and I think to an extent also because there's something exotic in traveling to the Middle East for a city break. It's right. not something people usually do. And the, again, the gap between what you expect Tel Aviv to be and, what, and your experience at the end of the day is very, very wide, and to me, as someone who deals with city marketing and city advertising, that's where the potential lies. Because if, if I go to, I'm trying to think where there's no one in the room from, if I go to Geneva, what I'll get is pretty much what I expect. And then there's no surprise factor, there's nothing that excites me because I'm already prepared for my experience. If I go to Tel Aviv, what I get at the end of the day is very different from what I expected. And that surprise factor is what excites people. And when people are excited about a destination, they become ambassadors of that destination. They return, like Cara said, and they bring their friends with them and they become spreaders of the word of, the word of that destination. How do you master plan the unexpected? That sounds for, <laughs> like the hardest thing to, uh, to have a strategy for, the eclectic and... You just let the city be itself. I think there, when we're talking about the select group of global cities, there's the really good global cities or the city, really good global city administrators or those who understand that their job is not to create, it's to facilitate. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at what's happening, the exciting things that are happening in cities around the world today are things that come from the bottom up and city administrators are allowing them to happen, are not interfering. I mean, a lot of times we as city administrators, by trying to help something, we can interfere more than assist. And when we look at ourselves as facilitators, and I think that's where city administration, that's where cities are going, then exciting things can happen. I mean, cities are a human experiment. They can't be controlled, they can't be planned. You can plan infrastructure, you can plan education building, but you can't plan where the human experience is gonna go. And once you understand that, then you build a master plan for the unexpected. I wanted to come back to you, um, Mary, on the, the sort of year-round tourism Experience. And look at the example of the Atlanta Beltline, because this is a project which has many, many facets to it, including yes. you know, beautiful parklands and things. Um, but it's also got affordable housing. It's got a real sort of job creation thing. How, can you tell us a little bit about how the city thought about that project, which is now 10 years into a 25-year project, um, to achieve that longer term? There are two key factors. Uh, there was a, a college student at Georgia Tech who had the vision to reclaim 22 miles of abandoned rail um, facilities that ran through 45 neighborhoods. And his vision was to activate it. And then he partnered um, with my predecessor, Mayor Franklin, who had the ability to galvanize the public will because uh, we were losing too much green space and tree canopy. So the question was, how do you do it? Um, we created a partnership that's invested about $400 million in private funding and it's uh, driven $3.2 billion uh, in private capital along the Beltline. And it's one of the three biggest drivers of our property tax digest because everybody now wants to live on it. Because their, the initial funding um, was publicly seeded, and we're able to make demands around affordability, affordable housing uh, in the area of 10 to 15% of the projects uh, that uh, are developed along the Atlanta Beltline. And in addition to that, 
and we're able to impose our will around what is built around it so we have some say so uh, and attempt to impact beauty. And uh, as, I, as I walked around Chicago, I was just overwhelmed by what a beautiful city this is. I've been to Tel Aviv and felt the same way. Atlanta is a younger city, so we have had le uh, a smaller number of tools to impact what gets built. And so the Atlanta Beltline is, is uh, now so popular that people have claimed it and used it. And, and this year, uh, last year, we had 1.4 million visitors. So that's more than the world of Coca-Cola. That's more than uh, the Georgia Aquarium, which is the largest aquarium in the United States. It's more than the National Center for Civil and Human Rights or the Martin Luther King Home. And I think that it's now an essential part of our character uh, and is really going to, uh, to, to help attract millennials uh, and people who want uh, something really special uh, that combines communities. I'm really excited about it. Paul Morris, uh, who leads the Atlanta Beltline, was on one of the panels uh, today. But Chicago um, really inspired me just to do more around the Atlanta Beltline. But in that instance, uh, we have had a seven to one return uh, on that $400 million public investment. Right. Is that, is that also a lesson in um, you know, trying to use these opportunities to create sort of tourism infrastructure or to, um, you know, to attract it to events to achieve things you were setting out to achieve anyway? That might be the... the exactly yeah, right, Andrew. Um, major sports events and the events uh, that Leo and Cara and I are talking about today allow you to do things because you galvanize the public will. You're already doing a large number of public meetings and so you can take on something that you would not have taken on before and get it done with robust public support. Uh, when I drive around the city of Atlanta, if you were in the city of Atlanta today and were driving around, uh, everywhere you looked, you could see a part of the Olympic legacy. So the Atlanta Braves Stadium was built at no cost for taxpayers. It's just off of a highway. And as you look on new different university campuses, you can see a building that was built for the Centennial Olympics that still stands and is a dormitory on Georgia State's campus or on Georgia Tech's campus or in the Atlanta University Center at Morehouse um, or Clark. And so uh, that's the way that I think you, you, know, you make the public argument. Right. Um, both uh, Leo and Kara, you talked about this as a branding um, you know, very much a branding thing. That's by definition harder to measure. It's a little intangible. Um, how have you tried to uh, to measure the, the branding return, the, the returns on the brand of Tel Aviv? Um, <laughs> I spent a lot of t a lot of hours trying. I'm not sure I've succeeded. Um, the way we measure our work on branding in general, everything we do to promote the Tel Aviv brand is first of all, we look at the tangible things. So we count the amount of articles in international press that talk about Tel Aviv in a specific context that we want to count on them, which we've managed to bring up in the last four years from 200 to close to 2,000, just by working on it just before nobody worked on it, nobody was focused on that. But sure, that's not just BuzzFeed slideshows. I mean, there's been a lot of- Yeah, uh, there's been a lot in New York right. Times, Financial Times, also been, been writing a lot. So number one is international press coverage and the quality of that international press coverage because there's a difference between a small newspaper somewhere in South America and the Financial Times, New York Times, etc. The other is we measure the amount of online social media discourse about Tel Aviv in specific contexts that we're interested in promoting. And we know how many people are talking about Tel Aviv, what they're saying, if it's positive, if it's negative. We use a really cool Tel Aviv startup that does that. Um, and at the end of the day, we understand those are, I think, marketing measurements. When it comes to branding, specifically when it comes to branding a place, at the end of the day, what you're doing is you're planting a seed in someone's mind. Hmm. And that seed can evolve into something that will happen tomorrow when they choose their next vacation destination. It can happen five years from now when they decide where to go study. And it can manifest itself ten years from now where they, when they decide where they want to go in retirement. And planting those seeds is something that I don't think you can measure as accurate enough. I think at the end of the day, it has to do with trends, and trends are also more difficult to measure. And when it comes to city brands, it's, a lot of it is the trending of the city and how, tre how those trends work and if they're in your favor or not. Cara, do you, do you agree with that? 
uh, yeah, of measures I mean, you look at? Yeah, we, I mean, we just launched uh, last year a new uh, marketing campaign called Chicago Epic, which is really focused on a lot of the regional and national marketing that we do throughout the U.S. and trying to get people to understand Chicago and all that it has to offer. Um, so with the new marketing campaign, they're focusing on everything of the culinary scene and um, all of the breweries that are coming up in Chicago and all of the music and all the concerts that are here. There's Lollapalooza, but any day, night of the year, you can go to a major concert, a small concert, um, you can go to the symphony, you can you know, go to House of Blues. Um, again, the culinary scene is, is exploding here. We've hosted James Beard Awards now for two years in a row and they're coming back. Um, and then showcasing things that are just so iconic and always have been affiliated with Chicago, whether it's you know, Harry Carey's or Navy Pier or Garrett Popcorn or you know, just everything that's so Chicago from Hancock to I have to say Willis Tower, but Sears Tower, but you know, and having people identify and say, oh, I know that building, and yeah. if they don't know the name, they know it's Chicago. And yeah. to see an experience unfold, or if they see a shot of Grant Park, and whether they know it's Grant Park or not, they know it's Chicago. And to measure that, I, yes, it's difficult, but I think you know, hotel occupancy continues to be a major driver for us in terms of a performance metric, but then a very easy way to say, Hey, hoteliers, you know, we have an economist on staff and, and we get our, our reports on what our forecasts are for the month and, and how the month just concluded and where we were with occupancy um, and then kind of forecast for future months on where we need to drive business. And when we're, you know, at 92, 93, 94% occupancy throughout the city and we have over 40,000 um, rooms in downtown Chicago and over 100,000 in the Chicagoland area that then includes the airports and whatnot. So we have a lot of hotel rooms to fill. And so when you get that number, um, why they are there, we know if it's a convention typically, but you know if, if the occupancy that's beyond the rate we expected to use for a massive convention is still full, we know that the leisure campaign and uh, coming to see what's iconic to Sh Chicago is driving those people to fill those rooms. All right, I wanna throw um, this open now to the audience. Uh, we have some microphones around, so please put your hand up if you have a question. And uh, I'm gonna start over here. If you could just tell us who you are and what your affiliation is and then I'll continue. Um, my name is Annie Logue and I'm a freelance writer who writes a lot about business and finance. So, Mayor Reed, you said something about these major events create accountability for your staff. But one issue is that some of these organizations, specifically the IOC and FIFA, have a reputation and a history of corruption. How do you look out for your taxpayers and how do you keep your staff accountable when you're dealing with partners who might not necessarily have your city's best interests at heart? I think you negotiate the best deal that you can uh, and leave it where it is. I think that uh, there is um, a very high level of energy around competing for these um, events. But you know, at the end of the day, um, the buck stops with me and the person that's gonna be held responsible Really, no matter what my staff person does, um, it falls with the mayor. And so, you know, Mayor Daly gave me some terrific advice uh, at dinner one night. Um, and what I do is, is I live a life of integrity. Um, I hire people who I absolutely believe in. We compete within the rules and we leave it there. And then we let the chips fall where they may. Um, that was certainly the case uh, in the Centennial Olympic bid in Atlanta. It was run by a man named uh, Billy Payne and Ambassador Andrew Young. It was through their combined efforts and it was really through relationships um, that we were able to secure the games. I think it's changed a great deal in 20 years, to be honest, uh, answering the intent behind your question. I think what you have to do really is, uh, is uh, to manage expectations within your organization and constantly make it known 
that you want to win within the rules and that anyone who does otherwise will be dealt with in a severe fashion and leave it where it is. Uh, I think that one of the, um, when we were competing, we meaning the United States for FIFA, um, that was a coordinated effort among mayors across the United States of America and we didn't prevail, Qatar did. But I think, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of the fallout and I'm really proud of the way that uh, the U.S. Uh, handled our bid uh, for FIFA, although I wanted to prevail really, really badly. Um, you know, I think the more that you continue to review that process, it shows that in the United States we competed with our hands on the table and in a way that, that brings honor and dignity to our respective communities. Okay. We had a question over here just in the second row. Um, Uh, first, I'd like to thank everyone here um, on the panel. This is really, really interesting. And my name's Roxanne, and, and as someone who has studied the Olympic movement, I wrote my master's thesis on the issue of referendums in the Olympics. And I'm really glad you touched on that because that's a huge uh, changing force for democracies that's happening right now. Um, yeah, you talked about Boston dropping out. Hamburg also dropped out because of a referendum. So my question for the panel is, with these rises that we're seeing in referendums and they haven't passed um, in recent years, if your respective cities were to bid, how do you think that bidding process would change? Do you think that there would be referendums? Um, do you think referendums are necessary to show that, that citizens want to host the games? And coming back to um, thinking about your citizens and what they want, is that an important factor? Also, after that, um, how would the bidding committees need to adjust to this increased issue of referendums and the negative uh, image that the Olympics has right now? Would the people I mean, of Atlanta expect to be given a vote? I mean, I, I'll take it. I mean, I'll take it. I'll just, just be straightforward. I wouldn't do a referendum because it would lose. I mean, I can read polling data. We polled before we went, moved forward with mm -hmm. the stadium. Um, it was 75-25 against. But what I did do is I made myself the referendum. I had an election. I went out and I explained to voters where I thought it was the right 10 and 20 year decision. We had a process that was very transparent. We did multiple community meetings. I had made it known that I was going to do this for a year. So this was not hiding the ball. And I put my career up. My election was in November. We had the vote on the stadium during the summer. And people forgot that when we won the Super Bowl last week. Everybody believed that we were all for the new stadium. That's not the case. So if you're going to take the referenda approach, you should prepare to lose. Because that's not really where the public is right now. Um, but I think, you know, as the mayor of a city, you have more information than most folks. And you were elected to call it, to make decisions using your best judgment. And most folks who I know are in politics love their job. So if I'm prepared to make a decision like we made and then stand for election where anybody could run against me and we could hash it out, I think that I did my job. But if folks start moving in the direction of this referendum every time there's a major decision to run a city, you're not going to have effective management of major urban areas. It's just, it takes too much time and it's too hard. I, so, you know, I think that's what elections are about. You know who you're voting for. As long as you don't hide the ball and as long as you do things in a transparent fashion and as long as you take the heat, and all of the negative stories and the bashing and the people going in the other direction in the grocery store. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's how, where I fall. Yeah, I would uh, just further that out. I think that Mayor Reed said it directly as uh, I think he uh, works in Atlanta, but it, we elect people to make those decisions. We need decision makers. So if you look at, at the opposite of that, are, are we, going to pull the people on yes or no, and are they making the decision yes or no? Is it just to find out if it's a yes? I mean, it's either way. Do you have somebody in the position to make the decision? We, we trust our leaders. Um, 
I hope people trust their leaders in their cities. I, I know that we have, I personally, and on the behalf of True Chicago and the Sports Commission, we have the utmost um, trust in Mayor Emanuel. And when we spoke about this a little bit earlier um, prior to the panel, but um, knowing that Chicago had bid for the games, would we bid again? And that wasn't a public discussion. It didn't have to be. We, we were all so invested in it. We wanted it so badly. You know, it, we didn't win, and we didn't even have the discussion. We weren't ready as a community. There didn't have to be a discussion about it. And um, if Mayor Emanuel decides that uh, he wants to put our name in the hat for a future um, opportunity with the Summer Olympics, then I, I'll be the first one to raise my hand and say, let's go. And yes, we'd poll people. We did had a very high... Um, acceptance and high poll ratings when we, we bid the community and we had a similar approach with you educate the community, you made them understand why this money isn't going to schools. Well, it was private funding that we raised, nearly $80 million. And so we raised it for the Olympics, so it wasn't taking away from an opportunity to invest in schools per se. So we've got a, we've got a question from Twitter that I, I want to put to the mayor again, which is really good, and I will come back, back to you, which really goes to the heart of the this idea of cities competing on the global stage with each other. Um, the question is, Chicago saw a huge population loss in 2015. You might argue about how huge it is, but saw a population loss. African Americans in particular are moving to places like Atlanta and Houston. What is Atlanta getting right? Um, I think people believe that you can come to the city and get a fair shot and a fair shake, and I think that you can have a very high quality of life in a manner that's affordable. And I think that uh, there are a tranche of cities that are exceptional cities that are becoming unaffordable to regular people. And I think that uh, it's very hard to reverse, but I think cities like New York and Chicago and San Francisco and Los Angeles are wonderful cities. But if you're a millennial, are you really gonna move to that city and have a broad quality of life um, that's consistent with someone who is a striver. And I think that Atlanta is doing really well in the striver lane. And I think that um, this issue around affordability is going to have to be confronted in a direct fashion. And then I think there are another tier of cities um, that have to get our arms around affordability and equity really quickly. Hmm. And so I think um, that's what Atlanta is doing differently uh, than other cities. Thank you. All right, I know we had a question just in the uh, third row here. Um. Hi, I'm Jenny Scanlon. I'm on the board of the Chicago Council, and welcome. This is a ter terrific event. Uh, my question is really the flip side of, of this referendum uh, comments that you made, which is once a leader has made a decision and the community is supportive of it, there's tremendous opportunities for engagement of citizens of all walks of life right. through that process uh, up to and including the event. What are some of the approaches or techniques that, that you've done in Atlanta or Chicago or Tel Aviv that have really engaged people in this process instead of just forcing or not uh, it, willing them to throw their house on Airbnb and leave town until it's all over with? What makes someone in Chicago or Tel Aviv feel in, involved in these events? And I've, with the, I'll go back to the NFL, but this happens with a lot of the major events. We host a huge legacy piece that comes with them, and they might be one-off events. They might not be from Chicago. Uh, they're coming in from New York or San Francisco, wherever uh, the event owners live, uh, you know, outside of Chicago, overseas. They come in, and then they're invested in Chicago. And um, Mary talked about, you know, how you work with someone maybe who's corrupt, or you, you're finding the right partnership. So both people are invested, and they want to see Chicago do well for their event and otherwise. They are now affiliated with your city, and your city does well. You know there is that trickle out effect, and it's it's good for them and their brand. So NFL comes in, and I'm sure you guys experienced a lot of benefit outside of just the room nights and the economic and the media value. But we had Verizon invested. I won't say the number because I don't know if they'd like to share, but um, 
planted trees, had a whole coalition of students from University of Chicago, um, Northwestern, and worked together planting trees in our parks. Um, we had um, the first ever Business Connect program with a draft, which I know they have for Super Bowl, which is to engage minority-owned and women-owned businesses to have the opportunity to bid for business when, this, when these opportunities come to our cities. Um, in addition to that, you know, making things free and accessible so that draft town is free, everyone is able to go, right. um, and creating opportunities for the youth. And I, I think that every single event we've had has had a major component of investing in opportunities for children and making sure that every neighborhood, every 77 of our neighborhoods is getting to be a part of the opportunity that's, that comes with the event. I'm gonna just try and squeeze in one more question um, here in the middle. And I teach about luxury at the University of Chicago Booth School. And my question is for Kara. In about 10 days, Chicago is going to host the Louis Vuitton America's Cup, the first time it's ever been held on a freshwater yep. body. Wow. How, that's a pretty elite event. They're sending mm -hmm. all their senior management over for all their brands to Chicago for this. Yeah. How did we ever land that? <laughs> well, thank you for bringing that up, and that was not a plug at all. Um, I'm glad that you're excited about it. Um, we actually were approached by America's Cup Event Authority when they had decided they weren't going to be returning to San Francisco after their incredible victory in 2013. Um, they approached us in several other U.S. cities and yeah, took a gamble on Lake Michigan could provide the venue that they needed in order to host the event. Um, in all honesty, we were vying to host the 2017 uh, Defenders Challenge that Bermuda um, won and it'll be hosted in Bermuda in 2017. However, the format has changed and they now have a World Series, um, about four to five events leading up to uh, qualify and rank the teams um, leading into the, the final. And they returned to us after making the selection of Bermuda for 17, um, kind of sour grapes, but they said, hey, we haven't ever been on fresh water, and we thought, what a, really an awesome pilot and opportunity, no pun intended, get our feet wet with this new sport, which is totally aligned with our strategy of being on the world stage, interacting with the international community at every touch point, and we're hosting teams um, the six teams competing, of course, Oracle Team USA, Emirates Team New Zealand, uh, France, Sweden, um, Italy. And um, I really think in a little way it's kind of going to be the Olympics we're not hosting uh, without any virus or mm -hmm. other <laughs> those types of issues that are of concern. And um, we had a great supporter here in Chicago, Don Wilson. Um, and this touches back on everything with having those private-public partnerships, and we would not have been able to host the event without his support, his enthusiasm and dedication for the sport of sailing, and um, the containers with all of the ships and boat parts that you need to reconstruct them have arrived. They're safely in Navy Pier, and the boats will be built, and uh, competition will um, begin next week, and we just can't be more excited. We'll see you on a fast yacht soon. Um, I want to squeeze in one very quick sort of yes, no answer type question to each of you. Um, if Zika were rife in your city right now, would you be hosting a major event like the Olympics parade uh, or um, the Yachting Challenge? You, you have the Not major event going on in about, yeah, what, no, like, 10 and a half hours? Yeah, that's wood, that nothing will happen within <laughs> those to, uh, 10 hours. Um, I think we've dealt with um, situations in which other issues have sort of uh, clouded over the events. And our feeling during whenever security issues or anything has risen around events is you're doing something for the long term, even if you do it a year, this year and not many people will come or won't achieve its, its goals. At the end of the day, you're in it for the long term and you don't stop it because of one event. Again, it's different when it's the Olympics, which is one event and what do you hold with it, but that's the way we see it. Kara? If we were facing Zika in Chicago, I would be somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Very wise, May I read. Wow, 
This is what's called a sinker. <laughs> so just at the end, after an hour and 15 minutes when you're exhausted, I think I'm going to avoid that question. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay. Because Bear Pies is a good friend of mine. <laughs> really? Well, um, I want to wrap up by thanking uh, our panel and our audience. Um, I took away, um, I think, four uh, lessons from that. One is that um, if you're jaded by this election, referendums could be worse. Um, if you, uh, first you have to feed your zoo animals if you want to avoid a balagan. Uh, and finally, the IOC could have chosen Chicago <laughs> Ethic. And That's right. yet, good. Too late now. Thank you very much to all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, everybody.